Okay, so they are students who are enrolled in university that take uh, extra courses and extra uh, credit uh, um, at the college. And they come from department in economics, in political science, in math, in particular in math. Uh, and, and we strengthen them in social sciences and, uh, uh, and in economics. Now, um, so that's, that's, uh, it's, a nice, it's a nice thing. So we typically have the graduation at the, end, uh, at the end of the year, but it's nice, I think, to introduce uh, to all the allievi who are here for the first uh, year, and maybe they are uh, uh, following us uh, um, online or in the other room, because unfortunately, it's nice to be back uh, it's nice to be back inside the college because in the uh, um, one of the point I, of the the pandemic was dramatic for all education but was particularly dramatic for the allievi and i realized uh, thoroughly during uh, our july meetings because uh, some of the allievi were saying but after the whole day in which uh, in which uh, i have to follow online these traditional courses why should i follow extra courses of the college online i mean because the the beauty of the college is the dimension of the college and the fact that you interact and, uh, and you spend time together you can go out uh, and enjoy lunch so uh, that's uh, that's very good and uh, and that in that sense very happy so um in the uh, the proposal of having this inaugural lecture was by Chris Krakowski and I want to thank him this is part uh, is helping me and in managing uh, wonderfully the the new track of the allievi so traditionally we have been doing mainly economics uh, with deepening in uh, um, in quantitative uh, uh, dimensions but uh, with the um, suggestion of Diego Gambetta and uh, uh, the new faculty, young faculty also of social scientists, we are trying to have uh, a new track in, uh, in social science. And uh, uh, thank you also for helping to improve the institution. So um, let's not commit, but it would be nice if we have something uh, like we're having today uh, every, uh, every year. Now, before then turning to, to Diego, we'll introduce the, uh, our uh, honor guest. Uh, I think it's nice to, um, to give the floor to one of the allievo. If I'm not wrong, uh, he's at the fifth year, he's Cesar de la, de la Pierre. I remember him uh, from his first year. I think he's been with us already for four years. And uh, it's one of the nice things is that uh, I see this young, uh, a brilliant student entering from high school, sometimes completely clueless of what is social science, what is economics, what is in general meaning and what you are going to do. And then following them throughout and then graduating and sometimes uh, going to the PhD and then becoming much better than I am. And so that's uh, part of the nice thing of, uh, uh, of doing what we all do. So I just give him the floor for a few minutes for introducing. Okay, so hello everyone and good afternoon. So uh, my name is Cesare and I am a senior allievo in my fifth year. Um, so I am starting the last year here at Collegio. So first of all, I would like to thank Professor Bart for his lecture and also Professors Garibaldi and Gambetta. And before going ahead, I would like to extend a warm welcome to every person present over here. And I'd like also to congratulate with the new allievo for their admission. So uh, to the new Allievi, probably uh, in this moment, there must be lots of questions coming up to you, such as what is this place like? How are the people? Will it be hard? And will I be willing to get what I'm looking for? And for all of these, I would like to say just one word, which is relax. Because I do remember that when I got into college, I had all the same questions as well. Um, but um, I got all the answers, at least up to now, positively, and I am sure that you, that you will too. So first of all, being a part of the Allievi program will allow you to study deeply uh, some of the subjects that you might like the most, such as economics and statistics, but of course there is more. Um, during these last four years, I've learned thousands of new things. I got to know better my interests, uh, my ambitions, and I hopefully understood what I want to do in life as a future career. And by participating in the Allievi program, you can really have the chance to receive uh, a high quality education, to stay in close contact with an excellent faculty, 
to attend a variety of seminars about a wide range of subjects so as to further develop your interests. And most importantly, you will enter a new community and you will meet new people and make new friends. And this is one aspect that has been fundamental for me to succeed in the program. Um, I'm not actually saying that everything will be easy and smooth because it won't be. You will have to work really hard. You will have to like solve problem sets, uh, study in for exams right in the middle of the semesters. You will have to meet strict deadlines and sometimes you won't even get a full understanding of the subject that you're studying. Uh, but that's perfectly fine. That's fine as long as you work together and you ask for help to your colleagues if needed because you're all very brilliant people. You're uh, academically outstanding people um, that can that, that come from different backgrounds and that can really help each other by providing different perspectives for the same thing. Um, anyway, you will see that with uh, efforts and that with consistency, you can achieve uh, anything you want. So my advice is um, really make the most of this opportunity, be enthusiastic and be participative. So to conclude, I really truly wish you all the best of luck for the upcoming year and um, for your future. And also, should you have any questions, should you have any doubts or should you have anything, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or to other senior allievi because we are here to help. So thank you very much for the attention and uh, really welcome again. Thank you, Cesare. So um, we now move to the more academic part uh, uh, of the uh, of, of our meeting. So I give the floor to uh, to Diego Gambetta, which is our senior uh, fellow and uh, senior scholar in social science, which will introduce uh, our guest speaker. I was saying it is a stroke of luck to have Ron here today. <clears throat> and in 2020, I accidentally stumbled on the Bocconi website, <clears throat> accidentally in fact, and uh, I noticed that Ron had been hired. So I could hardly believe my eyes. And I, I, I think uh, I am eternally grateful to Bocconi for giving us the, this opportunity. They've been, uh, and this will be very good for the social sciences in Italy to have him around. And, uh, um, However, his home base has been Chicago since 1993, where he's still now professor of leadership of sociology and strategy, Charles Harper professor, right? And, uh, and that's where we met in 1994. Uh, on the invitation of Gene Coleman, I went to Chicago and one of the interesting people I met uh, was Ron in his prime, in fact. <clears throat> and uh, in the meantime, uh, he has become a towering figure in his field, in our field, in fact. <clears throat> and uh, if, you, if you like numbers, and if you are an allievo, you, you're forced to like numbers. Uh, he has 100,000 uh, plus uh, citation, and he, has, and he can boast an H index of 73. But if we, if we leave number and we look at uh, substance, uh, Ron is a, is a special scholar because he, he has two, two very strong features. One is creativity and the other is self-discipline. He's incredibly hardworking. Whenever I am around him, I can feel the energy vastly. And now just as uh, 25 years ago, and I feel tired, I want to go to sleep after, uh, because he's um, more energetic than I can, uh, than I can survive. <clears throat> and uh, now evidence of his creativity is very ample, uh, methodologically and substantively. Methodologically, he has worked on networks and on networks position. And uh, he has done very important uh, formal work on that and on the structure of network, on the position of networks. <clears throat> and substantively, he has put this work 
to explain important economic, social economic phenomena. First, it was in a uh, diffusion, right? The first one was, was diffusion. And he started very early. He started in 1976, when I, uh, he already published an article in Social Forces that already had the title, Networks and Networks Position. No? So he started very early and he has stayed on that. And he has studied the effect of the structure of networks on diffusion, on innovation, on competition, famously, with his book called Structural Holes, on social capital and on trust. <clears throat> and he has been very much, uh, uh, you know the distinction that Isaiah Berlin made between scholars who are foxes and scholars who are hedgehogs. Foxes just jump around from one topic to the other, right? And uh, hedgehogs uh, just stay on the top. <clears throat> and Ron is very much a hedgehog. He's stayed on the topic with that tenacity, hard work, and imagination. <clears throat> uh, since the beginning, really, I, I wasn't aware you started. Uh, so so uh, he, told, he told me the story of, uh, of how he ended up there. Maybe he will grace you with the story later. <clears throat> also a recent development that has attracted my attention is that he has been looking at the structural sources of management myopia. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very good. And he, it's part of, of his massive contribution to the social sciences is to develop in a formally robust a uh, clear-headed analytical way, the context within which important economic phenomena take place. And so he is a controcanto of, of economics. <clears throat> and he's also the, the, you know, he stands in contrast to the idea that uh, um, Creativity comes from a certain disorder, anarchy, uh, laid backness, right? Uh, <clears throat> so the self discipline comes across from how much he has produced. I, I counted seven books plus several edited books. And he has on his immaculately tidy and useful website 87 articles, many in top journals. So today is going to talk about creativity and maybe we learn something about where his creativity has been, has been coming from, whether, whether he fits, is an example of the general case he's going to make or whether he's a, a rara avis, you know, a rare bird in, in that respect. So anyway, this is my welcome to Ron. I'm really pleased to have you here. It's time for me to shut up and you speak. <laughs> We like to think that our brain is something inside us, but it turns out that much of our brain is not inside us, that the physical organ is there, but the stimulation that makes it reach its potential is outside. And it turns on your ability to engage diversity. People who can engage diversity get paid more, get promoted more quickly, produce work that other people say that was a good job, get promoted to leadership positions to take care of the ignorati who haven't looked after their intellectual capabilities. It turns out it's incredibly simple. And that's what I wanna share with you. It may seem after you see this, oh my God, that's so obvious. And yet it explains 50% of the variation in achievement. It's huge. So let me begin. I assume I can get rid of this. Good. Um, these unfortunate things are intruding on what are nicely designed slides, uh, but we shall have to live with that. You can uh, download materials from my um, website. It's, you can just Google me. You, you should be able to get, uh, get to it. I'm just going to kick in. Broadly speaking, there's two pieces to this. Piece number one is how the network around a person creates competitive advantage for that person. 
I'll review a lot, enormous area of work in a few slides to get across the ideas. And then it's gonna turn out that that competitive advantage becomes manifest in creativity. Yeah? So two pieces. Piece number one, these are the senior people. There's 271 of them. The senior people in one of Europe's leading pharmas. There's a CEO, there's a C-suite, around the CEO, chief financial officers, chief strategy officer, et cetera. And then there's people who answer to these individuals. You'll notice the yellow dots. The yellow dots are heirs apparent. They are the people who are so able that the company top management presumes these are the people who are going to inherit the company. But they are idiot savants. They know their piece of the puzzle they just can't coordinate it with other pieces. So I was asked to come in to describe how networks work so that you can coordinate assets that aren't yours to own, but that you can use to create value for you and your colleagues. This is an org chart. A line here means that this person reports to that person. You're probably familiar with organization charts with a CEO, underneath the CEO is a C-suite, Underneath each person is a set of people, et cetera. That's a top down. This is a network representation of the structure of a, a company. Uh, and what happens is you take a 271 by 271 matrix and we wanna reduce it to two dimensions. So we're gonna collapse it where there's redundant information. And there's two rules to follow when you read something like this. Rule number one, two people, who are close to one another or are structurally equivalent in that they have the same relations to other people can be put close together in the space because you don't lose much information. If Diego and I have the same relations to everyone, we don't have to be separated in the space. We can put them in one location. Yeah, all is good. Second, the more that a person's connected to everyone, the more you put them at the center of the space because that minimizes distance to everyone. You follow? So the CEO goes in the center. And then you see, instead of uh, reading from top down, it's more like a Japanese print. It, you go in and it blows up uh, in, in the back end, back end of it. And you will see around these various people are their direct reports. So all good? Okay. What we did was ask these people, because we're gonna train them in networks. So the best way to do that is find out where their current network is. We ask each of them, who are the people with whom you have the most frequent and substantial work discussion? We didn't want just frequent because that would be too much clerical, but we wanted to include that, but also include the people who are important to you in your discussion. When we put those data into this map, this is what we get. Unfortunately, it's a little uh, covered there, but I think you can still see uh, where it is. What I want to ask you is, what do you see? Cesare, you like challenges. What do you see? First challenge is, can you see it? What do you see? What's the, what, what jumps out at you? It's just a data problem. Okay, so he's reading lots of lines in here. Yeah? Notice... There's little pockets, yeah? There's an Asia pocket. There's a US pocket. There is the main headquarters here in Europe that also includes their most lucrative market, which is the emerging markets. There's a back office, there's a front office. There's this little pocket that is the R&D um, uh, unit. The first thing that people usually see are the islands. The what? Islands, these clusters around. Now. What else do you see? May I ask? Bridges. So Bob is a bridge. You've got some bridges over here. Yeah. This bridge and cluster structure is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. If you find a network where everyone's connected, you're inside a cluster. Yeah. Typically, we have these pockets. People like Jim are gonna produce one kind of value. The people deep in the center of a pocket. People like Bob are gonna produce a second kind. Three characteristics to such a structure. 
Now in this company, the uh, groups are largely regional. Sometimes they're functional, sometimes it's legacy organization, sometimes it is product lines. However you organize it, you'll have bucket, 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 and then lines between them. Step number one, this is what networks look like. Often people think there's me, there's my friends, there's my friends of friends, and this thing just extends out. That's a hairball image. LinkedIn will produce such a network uh, uh, for you. That's inside one cluster. We always have this. Step number two, clusters indicate information. Because when people speak a lot with one another, they socialize one another. They come to similar understandings. And a lot of knowledge is not written down. It's tacit, it's understandings. And until you go to a place and live like those people live, it can be difficult to quite understand the way they see things. Now it's not impossible, you can see a lot, but you'll never quite get it. I've lived a long time in France. I lived here in Italy. There's something really productive about going to a strange place and having to rebuild yourself because the parts never come together again in the same way. There's this variation to it. The value of the connection with information is that when we see a social structure, we can see where information is. These people are going to see the work that this company does similarly. It's adapted to the US labor market. It's adapted to US legal code. It's company processes plunked down in another place. Up here, we've got the same thing with Japan. Over here, we've got the same thing with the country I'm gonna leave um, unmentioned. That means when big differences in information and perspective happen, they happen in separate clusters. They can happen inside clusters, but it's very rare. Much more often it's between clusters. That creates two ways for humans to make value in a social structure. Way number one is by being Jim. Become a warlord. Own the territory. And by closing the network so that everyone's watching everyone else, reputations emerge and nobody wants to be the loser in the group. So they work harder to maintain their reputation. They start looking the same. They start dressing the same. They start using the same jokes. They start using the same jargon. And as they are the same, they come down a learning curve. Closed networks are the key to efficiency. It's the basis for TQM, Lean Manufacturing, Six Sigma. Jim is an efficiency person. The other route to value are these connectors between groups. They are where growth happens. And the reason that growth happens there is breadth, timing, and arbitrage. Breadth, the more different groups you're connected to, the more, in essence, languages you speak, the more different expertises you can bring. That could be within economics, that could be across economics, sociology, could be within sociology, could be Italy, France, uh, the US, whatever it is, wherever you have variation in your network, you have access to people thinking differently. That's breadth. Second is timing. A person who sits at the crossroads at the intersection of different worlds will never be the first to know about things because they come out of the clusters, but he or she will frequently be the person that introduces them into the adjacent clusters. And when you're the early person to introduce them, you have a timing advantage in how to shape them. Arbitrage. These different groups speak different languages. The language of economics is different than the language of French literature, is different than the language of sociology, is different than the language of physics. The more embedded you are in one language, the more difficult it is for you to articulate what you know to people outside that language. The more you can translate, the more you can take an idea over here and deliver it over here translating it into a language that makes sense in the target audience, arbitrage. You take a commodity bit of information 
from one market where it's well known and proven, you move it to another market where they haven't seen it, but they've got the problem. All right. There are some heroes to the revolution, mostly they're dead. The insights that I want to share with you happened during the golden age of social psychology in the 50s following World War II. The US was concerned about the success of the fascist states in Europe and wanted to know how did that propaganda work so well. And so there was a slew of studies of how interpersonal influence worked and how mass media works. These people were priming it. And the two features that came out of that work were A, by random chance, people bump into one another. So if they have offices next to one another, they bump into one another, a relationship develops. Once a relationship develops, all the socializing and information homogeneity starts to happen. People in groups, by socializing one another, come to share beliefs, or they get out of the group. So you get this homogeneity. These are the two bits that came out uh, from uh, uh, this. Um, but I think you can sort of see it. And I don't want to reduce those poor people. Look at them sitting there. Yeah, so tell me something I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. We've only got these few minutes. Let's go for some value and worry about that later. I'd like to run you a quick quiz. I have here before and after. There are five, I've got a budget constraint of five contacts. Before network, one, two, three, four, five, they're numbered. In the after network, the heavy red lines, one, two, three, four, five. My question to you, how many non-redundant sources of information do you have in the before network? Please. What's your name? I see that there are more clusters in the circle. No, 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 but up here. Um, how, many, how many? It could be one if everyone's connected to everyone else, or it could be five, because there's five of them. So everyone is connected to sometimes two, sometimes five. It seems that everybody's well connected. Okay, so the answer would be one. They're all connected. You go one. How many would say one? It's okay. Um, Nobody invites you. I would say none. That would mean one. That means there's one source of information, yeah? And no one else? You, you feeling embarrassed? You okay? Okay. <laughs> the reason I ask this is that when people start thinking about networks, a little electrical engineer comes out of them and they treat a network as though it's an electric circuit. And Francesco is correct, they're all connected. There's one who can get to three, who can get to two, who can get to five, who can get to four. Yeah, they're, they're all connected. All and that is a huge difference because there is the set of five people. They're all interconnected indirectly, but notice there's two clusters. That distinction between all connected and two clusters were the ground rules for venture capital going into social media sites at the turn of the century. Friendster and LinkedIn were based on the first model. I will expand your social circumference. The list of names in your Rolodex will go up and therefore you will have a better network. The second image was just having people in the network doesn't tell you the resources that are in it because people are kind. There are accountants, there are economists, there's macroeconomists, microeconomists, who knew? Uh, until I went to Chicago, I just thought they were economists. Yeah? But it's very clear that they're these two genres uh, of, of economists. If everybody you know is this, in the same area, in essence, you're just an incremental addition to what they know. The trick is, how do they differ? In this case, okay, so that's good. So, okay, in this case, Four and five are connected, and one, two, three are connected. There's this one line that connects three and five, yeah? Usually we interpret networks in terms of the adjectives that are associated with the people. 
if I tell you these are engineers and these are finance people, then the before job is I'm running financing for engineering. Yeah. There is a person in engineering who has a friend in finance. It's rare, but it does happen. If you come down here, I've decided that of the engineers, number two is the one that's the worth monitoring. And I'm going to cut the others out of direct contact and open up two other groups. One, another engineering group and another finance group. Of the two people in finance, I'm going to select four as the person to monitor and open up the tie to another group. Three things just happened to me. One, it's, it's underneath here, breadth. Here, I had two clusters of information. Here, I have five. Doesn't guarantee anything, but ceteris paribus, the more clusters you have, the more likely you have varied information. The second is timing. Something happens over here. I'm going to learn about it, but more importantly, I'm the one that's going to introduce it. Arbitrage. Let's say this finance group comes up with a new way of budgeting that provides a lot of flexibility to tasks. I bring the memo that ex explains that finance um, activity to my engineering person. I say, what do you think of this? It's finance. I don't care about finance. I care about engineering. I said, if we do this, I can give you six months more time in your budgeting. Whoa, six months, that's incredible. The job of this connector is to find information and then translate it into a form that can be consumed in the target audience, like a mother bird eating the worms from the ground and regurgitating them to her chicks so that they can eat it. These connectors called network brokers Early, breadth, arbitrage. All right, there is uh, some jargon off on the side here. I don't know that I'll use it, but information inside these clusters is typically called sticky. Uh, and it's a way of describing information that won't move easily. Anything that involves tacit information, special bits of understanding uh, that haven't been codified yet, is sticky information. It's going to lock into the culture. Structural holes are the disconnects between these clusters. They are like a condenser in an electric circuit. It separates two separate streams. And the value of a network is not so much in who's in it, but how many holes it contains. Because the more holes you have, the more opportunities for arbitrage you have. My sense is that we don't need the metric part here. I'm going to burn right past it. Can I ask you? Uh, yeah, this. yeah. What is the, the shortest description of a, of a tie? Is it that I know you, I can call you, and I can speak to you? What are you after? Why do, why do you want that defined? I, I'm not questioning it. I just want to know what, what you're after. Uh, uh, the tie seems to be given exogenously in your, in your yep. universe. And so I just want to understand. Okay, I'm with you. How, okay, how no, that. if it's endogeneity, I'm, 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 I'm there. Typically, we'll look at, no, in fact, in this organization, these ties have evolved over time. They are treated at the current moment as exogenous. Of course they're not. No network structure is exogenous. They're all endogenous. Um, and I'll, I'll return to that theme uh, in, a, in, in a moment. Uh, and sometimes that troubles people because they can't guarantee they're exogenous, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Once you're in a structure, what are the implications of that structure? Give me a person who is in a situation where he or she is connected with a diverse set of people, that person is going to be different in a predictable way from someone who's connected with a lot of people who are just like him or her. And that person inside a closed network of homogeneity is going to have a series of behavioral issues um, that have been well documented. So in terms of estimating 
associations, uh, it, it, it needn't be looked at. As an interesting intellectual puzzle, there's a lot of work on how they co-evolve. And typically the correlations are around 0.8 between this year um, structure, next year success, next year structure. It's, it's very high. So there is that evolution. This contains about 20,000 executives. What I've done is across the horizontal axis, I've looked at the network around a, a manager and I've asked to what extent does this, does this manager have links out to otherwise disconnected people? Over here, I've got a manager who's got links out to people who are interconnected with one another. This is the point tied with what Cheshire was saying. The opportunity here is to mix with really able people who think differently, but it's also a bit uncomfortable. You might not feel as sharp as you would if you hang out with people who are just like you. You may occasionally look stupid. The ability to look stupid and walk away is a phenomenon for learning. Yeah? So we have a, 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 a measure of the extent to which the network around you is like a straight jacket, locking you in. The more connected the people around you, the more it's a constraining environment. The more the people around you are scattered around, the more autonomy you have uh, inside the situation. The vertical axis here is performance. How much money do you pay? How quickly are you promoted? What kind of evaluations did you get? There's a whole series of kinds of evaluations uh, that one can look at. Now they've been adjusted for company and person specific backgrounds. How educated are you? What kind of work do you do? All these kinds of things. Zero is what's typical for someone like you. These are Z scores, positive numbers, you're ahead of your peers, negative numbers, you're behind your peers. Are you okay? Okay. And what we get is this consistent nonlinear downward sloping association. The more closed the network, the lower the pay, the slower the promotion, the weaker the evaluation, the less likely you get promoted. The more open the network, the higher the pay, relative to peers, the faster the promotion, yada, yada. A key point, the red dots are average data on 2000 managers in US firms. The squares, are managers in three uh, corporations in Europe. The triangles are managers in Asia Pacific. The circles are Chinese entrepreneurs. And the stars are people playing a quest game called EverQuest. It's a lot like World of Warcraft. What's striking is negative 0.75 correlation, negative 0.73 correlation, negative 0.77 correlation, negative 0.71 correlation, negative 0.79. The stability of this return to the network around you is phenomenal. People who hang out with people like themselves don't develop the skill of breath, timing, and arbitrage. And the payoff is clear. So now I put you the, the following question. I just put you an association between brokering across structural holes and measures of success. But the network doesn't do anything. It's, it's, if we were um, archeologists, we would be studying the um, remains of people, what has been there. The network is what you've done. Comes the issue, how does that turn into achievement? And there's two key pieces. Who do I work with and what do I do? The people who sit at that intersection have an advantage in coming up with good ideas, detecting where a good idea will be. And by knowing how to take it through the obstacles of other people, they are more likely to bring it to fruition. Now, this piece is usually done with cases, but this piece I can get at systematically. Let me show you an example. This is Raytheon's supply chain. It's the uh, leaders, this is around the turn of the century. Uh, there's a set of uh, different, I didn't mean to break your stage. Uh, there's a set of different divisions. Uh, they're indicated by the color code. It really doesn't matter, except that you can see their silos in here. And there's a lot of connecting across the uh, uh, clusters. The 
CEO wanted a network analysis of the supply chain so that he could decide where there's redundancy and where there's too much cluster. He got that in that map. In the course of gathering the data online, I put a box into the survey that could contain 2000 characters that asked, what's your best idea for improving Raytheon's supply chain? And then type in a text. These are four examples. Reward program management for leveraging across the corporation, poor ability to forecast program releases uh, to the part number, accounting for program release, and on they go. They're not very long, but they're fairly substantive. I asked the two heads of the supply chain to rate these ideas, the executive VP in California, the executive VP in New England. They got 455 of these. One, two, three, four, five. This is great. This is awful. This is what I got. Over on this axis, over here, I have supply chain officers who hang out with people just like themselves. Over here, I've got those people who cut across those clusters that you saw. The circles are aggregate data for the Californian. The squares are aggregate data for the New Englander. Right away, you see America's culture difference. The guy in California loves everything. It's all guacamole and kumbaya. New England guy hates everything. We're all going to hell. It's just a question of how much brimstone we're going to lick before we get there. But put a line through each and notice how similar they are. If I take out the rater difference, I get this curve. And compare that to that curve. This one is more gentle because I've stretched out the axis. But it's that same downward slope. The managers who live inside a closed network, when they come up with an idea, it is deemed by senior management to suck out loud. When the brokers across different groups come up with an idea, that's a good idea. We should do something with that. Yeah. These are both very busy people. And they wanted to show disdain for this academic who was visiting as a vice president inside the company. I was the vice president visiting. Uh, and so they returned their evaluations, but they left a lot of them blank. Primarily they focused on where the good ideas. And I'm not gonna bother rating the weak ideas. It's a lot like recruiting junior professors. If it's just a disaster, I, I don't need to rate it. I'm just gonna focus on who's really good uh, as a, a potential candidate. So I asked, might that be an interesting dependent variable? How bad do you have to be to be blown off by both executive VPs? So imagine one, if both VPs decided you weren't worth rating. Zero, if either of them rated you. You get the dependent variable? That's this curve. The brokers are very unlikely to be dismissed. But look at that puppy climb. 40% of the people in closed networks get dismissed. Now, my first thought was that's because they have dumb ideas. That was wrong. And the way I can tell that is by looking at the text and seeing that people in closed networks use a lot of jargon. And why do they use jargon? Because if you live in a closed network of similar people, you all speak a tongue. And you can communicate very quickly with one another, but you're dead if you try to communicate outside of that group. And it isn't that you'll fail the one time, you'll never develop the skills to be able to do that. Yeah? There ends the terrible tragedy to it. One indicator of that is who uses familiar language. There was a, a paper, I think it was in science, but it might have been in PNAS, uh, where they looked at the titles of dissertations from people graduating from different ranks of schools. And what they found was the lower the rank, the more jargon that was in the title. The higher the rank, is relatively jargon free. First row is who has an outstanding idea. That means one of the two execs said, this is a five, a terrific idea. 
I broke the horizontal axis into thirds. The third with the most open networks, the third with the most closed, and the middle third. 23% of these network brokers, outstanding idea. 5%, 5%. It comes down very quickly. Who gets dismissed? 14% of the bottom third, 37% of the middle, 43% of the people in the most closed networks. Here's the purpose of this table. Who uses familiar words? There's a, a computer program called Luke, L-I-W-C, uh, which you feed text into and it matches words against a dictionary to give you a sense of the emotion uh, that's in there, the present tense, tense, past tense, et cetera. And one of the things it does is count up how many of these words are routine words. The more you use technical jargon, the less that your text uh, comes out of the familiar words. Brokers, 56, familiar, 46, 34. Now it's merely consistent with my hunch, but it was the best I could do in terms of technical. But what it says is that indeed, my perception of more technical words being used by people in closed networks is probably true. I'd like to pause for a moment. This is a phenomenal window for new research going on because what it does is link network structure, the way you're associating with people with sociolinguistics. You know? And there's just this enormous amount of work going on in linguistics to connect language with social structure. The key point here is that in order to communicate, brokers use language that's gonna work in the target audience. Think about what makes me creative if I am. Suppose I'm working with this group in some sort of role uh, and we work on, uh, uh, let's make the a McKinsey consultant because they get paid very well, it's a good place to be. Uh, I'm gonna work with these people on whatever's going on in their organization. And then I'm gonna come over to this group, the other group. And I'm gonna see a puzzle here that they already dealt with. Not because they're smarter, it's just it happened that this puzzle came up over there before it came up over here. I propose to you, you know, you might try X, Y, Z. And because I know how X, Y, Z works over here, when I propose it to you, I say, watch out for these side conditions. The response, God, that Ron, he really gets around. That's fantastic. Give me the 350,000 for that week. And it's worth it because it just saved you having to do an information search and the risk of finding something you didn't know how it worked. This is the margin that brokers add. They clear a sticky information market. You wouldn't know what to ask for. It's coded in their language. You need something in your language. You pay this consultant to act as a network broker, bringing you best practice from around um, market. And in doing that, I've never found a good consultant who would be a clever academic. Uh, they tend to be B plus academics, but wicked smart on how to communicate. Yeah? What they're really good at is delivering value. So they might not have 100% of an idea, but they deliver on 50%, whereas the expert would deliver zero of 100%. Yeah? So they have their value. Let me pause for questions for a moment. I'm now gonna take you into a um, science fiction uh, program. Are there any? Does this follow immediately to you? Please, sir. And, and could I know your name? A what? Could I know your name? Yes, Paolo Marti. Oh, uh, I have one observation and one question. Okay. This observation that I remember some years ago, I read an article that, not an article, like a newspaper article that said that in the uh, Google headquarters, uh, uh, it was recommended, uh, or in some cases, it was mandatory for people to play certain types of video games in order to engage cooperation. And uh, at the beginning, I thought it was complete nonsense, uh, but after one hour of this question, I started to think, okay, it makes totally sense because it actually uh, helps people build a spirit of cooperation to develop a kit or a 
May I just jump on that one thing? And I, I promise to keep the floor back to you. A key one, to put, first of all, Google could be run by chickens and it would still make a fortune. AdWords makes so much money that it really requires no management. They, they can do anything in, inside that company as long as AdWords still runs. Um, so they have a lot of frivolous looking things going on. But a key piece to these underlying activities uh, is not just a sense of cooperation community, but cooperation despite differences. You don't feel awkward looking a little simple in front of things. You feel very awkward looking simple in front of people you think are gonna judge you. Right? And so it's huge for that facilitating um, access to diverse information. Your, your question. Uh, I am actually baffled that the, the we see the suit is not the most uh, maybe hottest point of interaction because I was thinking, okay, yeah, the VC suit actually is a link between the various heads of the various clusters and from the CEO. So I assumed that in order to have the maximum output, one would uh, try and uh, um, network with the suit that actually is the people that are at the margins of the of the main cluster and at the beginning of the smaller cluster which absolutely blow, blow my mind blows my mind i don't know why i want to say that there's so many fun questions I want, to, I want to ask you that they might embarrass you. So I'm, I'm just no, going to no, say, I'm no, not no. To it's, it's, it's all good. <laughs> Children often think that their parents know everything. The fact is senior management knows bunkers. They know very little. In fairness, this is the top 271. So these two people are, are not isolates. It's just that they put all their energy into the silo down below them, yeah? One of them is legal and one of them is risk. I, I, I pointed to this one, I don't know which is which. Um, nobody wants to talk to these people. It, it's a lawyer and a risk guy. Yeah? And they are creating an incredible problem for the company. This company is in court all over the world for shoddy goods, bribery, a whole series of activities where local people have pushed just over the gray line. Yeah? This is something that risk should have been looking at. And this legal guy runs like a boutique law firm inside the company. He should be penetrating into the company to find out where we are exposed. So it, it's a huge problem. At the same time, um, it's not like they don't have ties. They have a lot of ties going down. It's the segregation of those ties that's the worrisome uh, piece. It's a very good catch. I have a question. Please, please. How will cursor influence on, on the team and how it would be on the app it to be network broker? The cursor, like maybe Japan, uh, USA, how would this work? So let, let me say, state this. I forgot to repeat the previous uh, question. Let, let me state just to make sure because you poor devil with a mask on, it, it's like you're talking how through underwear. In a network broker. No, no, I, I understand. I, so, how does something affect the, the tendency to be in a network yeah. broker? What's the something? Uh, the culture. Culture. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, it's 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 really interesting. Not at all. And that sounds that's impossible. Check it out. These are managers in Asia Pacific. Now, some of them are Chinese, but some are Australian, some are from the Philippines, some are uh, from uh, Asian, that they're scattered around. These are entrepreneurs in China. Uh, two random samples uh, of them from the Yangtze Delta uh, area. Uh, in fact, uh, the book that won the um, Terry Award for the best management book of the year in 12, I think, uh, was based on, on these data. It's a phenomenal data set. And the correlation there is just the same as in Europe and in the US. Now, it doesn't mean they go about it the same way. They'll dress it differently. You'll talk about Guanxi uh, instead of talking about networks. There's a different language, but it's brokers who do better. And that's one reason why I'm just particularly struck with the stability of this um, generalization. Is that a, no, that's a, that's a head scratch. <laughs>
No, I'm not reading the crowd too closely. Any others? Please, please. please. Uh, you, uh, although you said very explicitly that form methods are technologies, obviously, some of your points are made clear by uh, describing them as if the network is yeah. exogenous. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Uh, and this leads me to the question uh, Would you say that uh, there's chances that puts people in a position that will make them? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I'm there. I'm there. It's such a good question. It's such a good question. So first, let me go even further than you in that direction. When you see this association, people who are brokers, breath, timing, and arbitrage, uh, they have more opportunities to detect and develop rewarding opportunities. Okay. And it looks like that works. But now turn that around. You go into a company, you do a fantastic job on your first assignment. People are going to start calling you from different parts of the firm. You're going to end up with a broker network. But it wasn't the broker network that led to success. It was your success that led to the broker network. These things are correlated about 0.8 through time. It is empirically impossible to separate them out. You can hope for natural experiments. People will sometimes say uh, an MBA program shut down and then people were reorganized and new ties developed, but there's always a thread of endogeneity. The only way we can put stake in the heart of endogeneity, which is which came first, the network, is to randomly assign people to networks. Yeah? And when we do that, we can measure, well, who does well? The ones assigned to a closed network or the ones assigned to a broker network. And what we get is that the more closed the network to which you are randomly assigned, the lower the performance. The more open the network to which you are randomly assigned, the higher the performance. Now, it doesn't guarantee causality because no experiment can do that. All it can show is that in these conditions, it's possible to be causal. Given that it has the functional form of the other associations, I'm willing to go with a metaphor, but I'm always conscious that it is a metaphor. Okay. Did that speak to you? Yeah. Okay, thank you. If I might just add a Please speak. I've spoken once to a person that worked with the organization in the HR of the bank, and she didn't know anything about networks, of course. And she was telling me that she kept on. Uh, trying to convince the new people that were hired that it was better for their career perspective if they would be assigned to not to just one branch, but be moving around because out of their experience and common sense, you know this, that the more uh, the new hired people were moved around, the, the faster they would, they would learn and the better they would perform with the company. It's a really interesting, interesting point. Again, um, how do I, so many ways to come at this. Um, I understand. Um, I'll, I'll go you one step um, further in that direction. It's not always good to just be moved around. It is good if most people are not moving around, which is probably the situation now. But it turns out people who are consistently, just imagine that graph back, people who are consistently brokers don't get much reward on being a broker. People who are consistently closed don't get much reward from a closed network. The people who get a big reward from connecting around are people who oscillate. So I move into a new area and then I hunker down, I dig in, yeah? I build a closed network, people get to know who I am and then I get out. It's not that a closed network is the kiss of death, it's staying in a closed network that's the kiss of death. Yeah? So it, it's one layer deeper than she said, but it's exactly in that, in that, that direction. And, and that is right out of the frontier uh, because the difficulty is finding temporal data where we can watch the ebb and flow of the, the network. Typically we have panel data or you know, may, maybe even just two panels or for some of this, just one panel uh, through, you can't say much. Good? Okay. How many of you know the show, Doctor Who? You've heard of it? Okay. I, I don't get it. 
um, I, but I've got a paper coming out uh, on it um, next month, I think, in the Academy of Management Journal. Um, these are the team um, work of writers, producers, and directors of the show Doctor Who from 1963, the first episode, through 2014. It's still going, uh, but that's when the data stopped because we wanted to start the analysis. A line means that these two people worked on the same episode, at least one, uh, one episode. The heavy lines indicate multiple uh, episodes together. The task is, how can we use a history of team assignments to build a network that indicates how you're exposed to diverse information such that we can pr predict which episodes are creative. And the way, uh, uh, first, this is the 200 people who worked uh, in it. For any area of activity, you can build a network of team assignments back to the past. There's a huge amount of work going on now using academic literature, where you'll take an article and the authors of the article are a team. And then you lay these teams on top of one another to see what kind of network is around this person or that person and how many citations it gets and how big an impact it has. What you can see here is that there's a flow from um, left to right with time. These are the first uh, people in. Then there followed a group here where this fellow, John Nathan Turner, uh, was the only producer uh, in this set and he tended to fire people very quickly. So he ended up the bull goose uh, in the uh, activity. Uh, then there's another cohort that comes in. There's a 14 year gap here. Another group comes in organized around this, uh, Phil uh, Collinson uh, as the producer. And then it moved into the modern era where there's lots of uh, more people uh, in it. The way we got at diversity from a team history is the following. This is looking at team histories for a person A. Here's A, here's A, there's A. In the first row, A is working with BCD. On the prior episode, worked with BCD. And on further back, worked with BCD. That means A's network is three colleagues and the constraint is very high because everybody's working with everybody else. You follow? Okay. In the middle, a has uh, B and C, but not B. Then A and B were together, C and D were together. It's a little bit more varied. There's five colleagues. It's a little bit lower. In this sheet, the most uh, open is, here's A. A worked with a set different than B, C, D. A, B, C, D worked with different people here. And the constraint is lower. When we look at the creativity in the episodes. Yeah, I skipped it because they were looking a little hammered. That'd be you. Um, you, know, you know, if you leave the sponge in the sink and the water's running, there's only so much water that sponge is going to hold. And you put a little heat in the room and, and we, we, get, we got ourselves. Uh, so Network constraint varies from zero to 100. It's the um, proportion of your network time and energy that's consumed by one group. So if I spend all my time in this group and you guys all know each other, it's 100%. If I split myself between the two groups, it's 50%. Yeah? And then depending on how I spread myself across others, it'll go down. Okay? So step one, um, how many are needed? It really depends on the line of work. There's an old joke. Two guys, uh, burglars, are breaking into a house uh, and it comes a giant Rottweiler around the corner, yeah? uh, barking, big teeth, and slobber, all that stuff that Rottweilers are good for. And they start tying their shoes to, to get out of there. They, the one guy says, we can't run faster than that. The other guy says, I don't have to. I just have to run faster than you. Yeah? That's how many bridges you need. One more than everybody else. So when I look at manufacturing managers, one bridge is about what they have. Two, you're Genghis Khan. If I look at investment bankers, eight to 10 are what they routinely maintain. It's, 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 it's a kind of life I would find too stressful. Um, uh, but... 
just constant exposure to different groups. So I think it, it depends on the, the kind of work that you're um, uh, after. Uh, academic life. There's the diffusion uh, part. I, I, of course, uh, agree, agree with that. But I've been struck with, uh, as I go around and do workshops, um, I don't know the people uh, here. It's so nice to see people with trousers on. I mean, I'm just accustomed to seeing heads on the screen and God knows what's going on on the, on the, on the other side. Um, um, uh, I've been struck at how you need to find something in the audience that rings a bell for them. And it's very hard to have a text that is going to work for everybody. Uh, and so I will usually look for a face that's happy and then see what they seem to engage. You're my man here. Uh, and it just, there's certain things he picks up on. Okay, we'll go that way. So you, you saw I dropped out some of the slides because it wasn't working. Yeah? So my sense is it's not consulting. It's about truth. But some people are ready to hear truth in a certain bottle and others want to hear it in a different uh, a bottle. So I think this creativity piece applies extremely well to academic life, casting it in a way so that it will reach the target audience. Yeah, thank you very much. Very I was, uh, while I was hearing your talk, I was thinking uh, about the, uh, what it looks like to me like a paradoxical uh, thing is the gender. Uh, uh, I wonder whether you have uh, research on this because what you happen to be located in an organization, it depends on, among your other perspectives on what the employer thinks you're good at. And women are paradoxically considered to be very sociable beings, and for this reason, tend to do the, the, the daily, routinely, but they are hardly doing things put in the brokerage position. Um, and then I wonder whether. You, you have an analysis that shows, you know, men are trying to be entrepreneurs, whether these turns out to be an advantage and an explain to their Okay. Uh, so you got lots of levels there and you've dug yourself into a very depressing place and they bring you back to the light. There's a lot of women who are brokers. Most of the time I find no gender difference. And all the time that I was in uh, Raytheon, one of the first things I would do when I went into an area and built out the network was test for gender bias because they're engineers, it, it happens. Yeah? Um, and also for legacy problems. There were a couple acquisitions they made where they treated the people badly uh, and then that sort of lingers uh, afterwards. I never found it. However, uh, of the six investment banks I've been in, one of them had a phenomenal problem. And a woman who tried to be a network broker on average, lost 950 million, I'm sorry, $950,000 a year in bonus compensation because it was uppity. That's not your role in this organization. There's a quick workaround. It's an amazing thing. The workaround, you get a broker to say, she's not like other women and it's gone. Let me give you an example. Uh, when I first came to Europe to live, it was INSEAD. And I'd done a series of consulting activities in the US uh, and had some success with it. So I was comfortable and things were moving along uh, well. But I could read about Europe, but I didn't know it. And I knew the only way I'm going to do that is go live there. So I took a, a tenure position at INSEAD, I think it was the Shell Professor of HR, uh, and started calling them French firms. My French is horrible, but. Um, they usually have a representative. It'll get by, I can apologize in French and then move on to, to English. And I would meet a 30-ish fellow, oh, usually a fellow, in very good shape, not buff shape, just good shape, well-dressed, charming, and excellent coffee. And this is back around the turn of the century before there was a pellet stuff. So somebody had an Italy machine in the, in the, in the building and cookies to die for. The French are not afraid of butter. And then we would have this charming conversation and he'd say, no. And this happened five times. And what's going on? I've never had a run of five no's. And so at lunch at INSEAD, Chicago subsidizes research, INSEAD subsidizes lunch. 
They have five chefs. It's an incredible thing. And they want all the faculty to go there. So they have this very good food. I'm there and I'm whining about not getting through uh, to French companies. And there's a fellow there who's dean of uh, school back behind NCAD called Setup, who says, no one's going to give you data. I said, why? I hardly knew him. He said, you're an American. I said, what's that got to do with it? A Frenchman would lose his career giving you data. But I need someone to teach network classes. If you will do that, I will make introductions and you will get into French firms. <laughs> teach networks all day long. So I'll never forget that day. I walk into an amphi. There is the CEO of Renault and his entourage. There's the CEO of uh, Rome Polanc and his entourage. There's the CEO of L'Oreal and his entourage. And the CEO of ING, which was the fourth of the companies that built this, this school, uh, couldn't come, he sent an executive VP of some kind. The guy gets up and says, this is Ron. He knows a lot about management networks and he's not like other Americans. Now at the time I was pissed. Yeah, but they thought, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to get French data and go home. Uh, uh, and so I, I went with it. But what struck me later was hearing that phrase again and again, where a sponsor would say, she's not like other women. He's not like other MBAs. He's not like people from Texas. There's always something. And what it means is this person who's well-connected is saying, I know the stereotype. I'm not questioning it but this one should pass. Getting that is what gets you through. And then you see the same returns to brokerage that the advantage group uh, I would get. Now it's not a cure, but what it means for me, I worry about the students succeeding and it is the absolute workaround. And I mean, here I am, I'm an, an old white male. I mean, I should have lots of advantages, but not in France. So I, I too uh, needed this. Uh, there's a paper on my website called The Gender of Social Capital that will give you the tests and some of the background. What do you think? 